So, um, as she said, uh, right after your last appearance at DLD, you were acquired in a $19 billion deal uh, by Facebook. So, two years on, what is, what is your relationship to Facebook, basically? Well, th thanks for having us. We're always happy to be in Munich. Uh, as Tepe said, we were here two years ago, right before the deal was announced. Um, back then, we had uh, approximately 450 million users, and uh, we've more than doubled since. And I think the relationship with Facebook uh, has helped us uh, focus on growth, and uh, it has helped us focus on making a product better, which is what something that has always been important to us. And uh, since, since the acquisition, we, we were basically able to continue down the uh, path and, and execute on a vision that me and Brian and the team has always had. So we launched things like voice calls, for example, last year, and we've launched things like a web client uh, for WhatsApp. That, that is something we always wanted to do. And for example, with something like voice calls, we were able to launch it using Facebook infrastructure. So we didn't have to go ourselves and buy thousands of servers. and. Um, as many of you know, we have a very small engineering team, and for us to maintain and manage that infrastructure would be very painful. So we've been able to leverage uh, Facebook infrastructure, and Facebook has helped us a lot with HR and recruiting and many other things. At the same time, we're able to maintain our independence, which was kind of part of the deal. Um, we're in a separate building in Mountain View. We, uh, we build a product the way we want to build it. We use our own engineering stack. Um, obviously, there is integration when it comes to legal and HR and, and biz dev and many other functions. But in terms of pure product development and product vision and engineering, we're still completely separate. We still operate like a startup. Okay. You, you mentioned the Facebook infrastructure, um, which um, is literally one of the most advanced on Earth. Uh, yeah. they've, they've now got data centers um, in Europe as well as uh, various places in the U.S. They have a, their own CDN network, yeah. content delivery network um, across the globe. So how specifically do you make use of that? Well, voice, uh, voice calls is one example. So for example, if you have a person in India who wants to call another person in India, you don't have to backhaul the traffic all the way back to North America. So we were able to leverage this content delivery network CDN, which uh, basically has pops uh, all over the world globally. Um, multimedia is another example. We're obviously doing a lot of uh, messages and uh, a lot of video and a lot of multimedia that goes through our application. In fact, I was talking to somebody uh, right, before, right before we got on stage and they were saying that images are, are extremely expensive to send using SMS and it's obviously um, different with, with WhatsApp. It's, it's uh, extremely cheap. And uh, so we have a lot of people who use WhatsApp to send message, uh, images and to share videos. Uh, with our friends and family, and we're able to leverage Facebook infrastructure for that. Again, if we didn't have that partnership, we would have to ourselves go and buy hundreds, if not thousands, of servers and, and hire dozens of engineers. Today, we have two guys running our entire kind of multimedia infrastructure, uh, supporting uh, all the users that we have. Yeah, yeah that, that conversation you had backstage was great because it, it, it encapsulated why you guys were so successful yeah. initially and why you continue to be so successful that, that you gave people a way to communicate via text and send images without paying high texting fees. Um, what's the situation with voice calling? Um, is, is, there, is there a similar force there that's driving that? How widely used um, is that? And how widely used will it be in the future, do you think, in, in various areas? Well, we, we've launched voice calls about six months ago, and it's going really well. We're extremely happy with, with uh, how it's been so far. But uh, everything that we do is an ongoing process. We, can t we, we always iterate whenever we launch something. So for example, we launched a web client that didn't have all the functionality we wanted to have, but we've added and we continue to add. And same with voice calls, we continue to improve. And uh, Every, every day we make tweaks and we make uh, small improvements to the system to make sure that you don't have echo when you talk to somebody, you don't have latency, you don't have delays, that people use optimal codec for their phone. We try to be very conscious about bandwidth. So that's the other thing because if you make phone calls and your phone chews up a lot of bandwidth, then it kind of defeats the purpose of using um, voice over IP. So everything we do is very iterative and we've been extremely happy with the way our voice calls and our voice calling has been since launch. Got it. Now, how about video calling? Is that something you're, you're considering? Is that going to happen at some point? 
We tend not to talk about uh, what it is we're going to build. We, we did it once with voice, and it kind of didn't work out so well because uh, it was a little bit delayed, and it took us a little longer than we, than we wanted to. So in general, we have a policy of just not talking about what it is we're going to build or when we're going to build it. But uh, we'll see, maybe. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Um, so, you know, I cover tech from, from Silicon Valley, and when you were acquired, the, uh, the reaction was so interesting because m so many people, even influential, you know, insiders in the Valley had never heard of you, just because in the U.S. you're, you're not used as often um, as you are in the rest of the world. Is, is that changing? Are you seeing more growth in the U.S.? Well, we, we actually always try to stand as a radar. Um, and, you know, when you say that a lot of people haven't heard of us, we, we actually take it as a, as a sign of uh, we did our job somewhat well. Um, but uh, you're right. In North America, a lot of people didn't hear of us when the acquisition was announced. Um, but that obviously wasn't the case in other countries. You know, people in other countries kind of looked at it and said, yeah, it makes sense. Everybody I know in my country is using WhatsApp, right? Like in Germany or Spain or a lot of other countries. And so uh, for us, it, it, uh, it obviously wasn't a surprise because we knew that um, we didn't start out uh, really strong in North America, but we continue to grow. It's our, it's our top 10 country in terms of growth today. Um, and we just take a very long-term approach to it. We're not, we've historically thought of ourselves as a global company. We've never focused specifically on one country. So everything we've done has been done with, okay, how can we build our product that is global and that is usable in every single country and not a specific geography or demographic or anything like that. And so uh, with North America, we continue to grow and we just take a really long-term approach to, to the growth there. Got it. The other big question when you were acquired in, in, in Silicon Valley in particular was, was how you were going to make your money. At the time, um, your business model was free for a year, um, uh, a dollar fee annually. Um, how has that, that model worked over, over uh, the, the, the course of the company? Um, does, does it hamper growth at all? Does, um, uh, what role has that played, first of all? So part of why we partnered with Facebook is that it, it allowed us to focus on growth and focus on uh, making our product better and our community and our user base. And we didn't have to think about monetization. We didn't necessarily have to uh, focus so much on it when we were independent. And so for the last two years, we haven't really spent a lot of time uh, putting work and effort into this subscription model. And in fact, we've recently decided to just go away with it completely. Uh, so today we're announcing that WhatsApp is going to be free for consumers. We're not going to charge people a dollar a year anymore. Because it really doesn't work that well in, in a lot of countries, and it's hard for people to pay. They don't have a credit card. They don't even have a bank account. And we just don't want people to think that at some point their, their uh, communication with the world will be cut off. It creates this kind of anxiety in, in our network that we don't want people to have. So we're going get to get rid of the dollar a year subscription uh, over the next couple of weeks completely. And instead, what we want to start experimenting with this year is this notion that we internally refer to as commercial participation. And basically, when you think about communication throughout your day, you communicate half of the time with your friends and family and half of the time with businesses. And we've done really well with the first half of the equation. We've done really well making sure that your communication with your friends and your family and uh, your, your coworkers and your, if you're a student uh, goes really well. But there hasn't really been any effort to make business and consumer communication work really well. One example that I always give is when I want to make a reservation at a restaurant, I have to call them, uh, leave a voicemail. They probably call me back, uh, and my phone like is not with me. So they leave me a voicemail. I call them back. At that point, they're open. It's busy. They don't understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to make a reservation for six. Uh, at 7 o'clock, they make reservation uh, for 7 o'clock, uh, for 6 o'clock, at 7 o'clock. It's always this confusion that ensues. And so uh, even yesterday, it was a friend who is here in the audience. We were trying to get pizza last night, and we were like, trying to call a restaurant to see if they're open. It was just really, really painful to do. Um, there are many other examples. So for example, uh, you know, if your flight is late, you can get a notification. Uh, right now, it comes through SMS, so you have to download a separate app. So if you fly five different airlines, you have to download five different airline apps. And uh, even with something like a credit card, 
they send you a uh, alert to see if the transaction has been fraudulent. I, I love flying Lufthansa, I have a Lufthansa credit card, but every time I get outside of California and try to use it, I get this alert which says, did you really use the credit card? Was it you? And I have to like reply and a text message was one or zero if it's yes or no, and it's just like right. very, very complicated. And it's not a great user experience. And so when we think about our philosophy of building something that is utilitarian, that, that helps users in their daily lives when they communicate with their friends and family. We kind of want to experiment with doing the same with businesses and make sure, make sure that the communications that you have with businesses is just as efficient, it's just as easy, and it's just as simple as what we've done with consumer space. Got it. This is part of a, a larger, larger trend. Uh, WeChat um, in China, Tencent, a messaging app, um, has moved into this area with a lot of success. Um, in other places, uh, Facebook has its own messenger app, and, um, and they're trying to go down this road. They just announced an SDK for developers um, at businesses to build this kind of thing into its messaging app. Uh, do you see yourself as evolving kind of in parallel to those? Is, is, is WhatsApp uh, different in any way um, when it comes to this type of commercial Messaging. Well, we, we parallel in a ways that we've been parallel in, in consumer messaging, right? Uh, Facebook is consumer messaging product, WeChat is consumer messaging product. But you have all these nuances about how you think about um, user experience and how you think about uh, the social graph and how you think about which people you connect with. So, for example, on, on WeChat, I think you can connect with a username. On Facebook, you obviously use your Facebook ID. On WhatsApp, you use a telephone number. And so all of these are different, and when we think ourselves about our user experience with businesses. Well, I probably have 10, 20, 30 different businesses in my address book already. Uh, or if I want to contact a restaurant, I should be able to just message them and say, hey, can you please get me a reservation for 6 p.m. for five people and just be done with it instead of calling, leaving a voicemail, having them call me back. Um, and so when we think about all those experiences, you know, I personally just hate phone calls in general. Like, I'm not a person who wants to get on the phone because I have, a, I have an accent and I speak really fast and nobody understands the word I say. So for me, it's just like if I can just message a business and right. get my point across and have them do something that I want, that would be great. Uh, but you're right, there are different platforms out there, but if you think about how they're different in a consumer space, that difference kind of applies to the enterprise and, and commercial space as well. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I think this makes, it makes a whole lot of sense in theory. I wonder if, if the opportunities are different in different parts of the world. I mean, just to take, take the U.S., for instance. Again, the U.S. is kind of different than other places, and, and the, the mobile ecosystem is, is so developed, and there are so many ways for me to communicate with businesses already. Um, I question whether or not things are going to evolve that way in the U.S., but it seems like there's a, a much greater opportunity in, in the developing world where there's not that infrastructure and you can kind of grab hold of things right. the way you grab hold of, hold of things uh, you know, just with, with straight message. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We already have anecdotal reports of people using WhatsApp for businesses. We have people in India uh, use what We have somebody who runs a deli shop who takes order for sandwiches uh, in India through WhatsApp and just makes sandwiches for people. We, we know of people who, um, we keep hearing the story about uh, somebody who makes chocolates and sells chocolates through, through WhatsApp to their clients. So we already have all these anecdotal evidences of, of people using WhatsApp to help power and help run their small businesses. And we just want to build better tools and better user experience to make it available to, to larger set of uh, commercial enterprises and people who want to communicate with those commercial enterprises. Got it. And, and you imply that this would be um, a way of making money. This may be your main way of making money. That, that would be something that we're going to start experimenting with and try to go down that path, yes. Okay, got it. So what can you tell us about the specific experiments, what you're going to do? Sounds like you're, you're not going to tell me. Well, we're at the very early stages. I mean, I mean, first of all, to be honest, we haven't written a single line of code for this okay. yet. So uh, I think first it's important for us to communicate our intention and make sure that everybody understands that we're not talking about putting ads into our product and we're not putting about some kind of making sure that spam can happen. Like, we're obviously very strongly against it, uh, both me and Brian. And uh, we want to build something, again, that is very utilitarian. And so we have to think about what kind of uh, features and what kind of functionality do we build that allows a company like American Airlines or, or a company uh, like Bank of America to communicate with our consumers efficiently through a messaging app like WhatsApp. Got it. So when you're discussed, the other big question that, that comes up is, is how you do relate specifically to what Facebook is doing 
with Messenger. You know, they have this, this app that seems um, to be almost a duplicate of yours. Um, you know, why does it behoove Facebook to have, to have both of you? Is it about just geographical split? They're good in, in the areas that you're not and, and vice versa? I think there's definitely some aspect of a geographical split, but I think the fundamental difference is how we think about the user experience and the graph that we have. So when we started out in 2009, the, the one thing we've done, which nobody has done up until that point, is use a phone number as your, as your uh, kind of ID in a way. And our thinking was like, well, if people already know your phone number for calling or for SMS, which is going to be a third kind of entity that is on the same level, uh, on the same level as calling or SMSing somebody. And so we built our network around this concept of your phone number is, is in a way your ID because it's already in people's address books. Um, Facebook Messenger is different. It uses Facebook Graph. Uh, it works on desktop and mobile. Um, it, it's just a little different in terms of user experience. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it has stickers. It has things that we don't necessarily have. And so what, what we find, interestingly enough, is that you, know, you, can, you can think to yourself that the messaging space is limited. But what we find is that actually it's not, and that people find more and more bandwidth to use products like uh, WhatsApp and products like Facebook Messenger and, and Instagram and Snapchat and, and everything else that is out there. And you know, it, just, it just seems like when you look back 10 years ago and you say, well, the messaging space was X messages, uh, X billion messages, and you think today it would be the same. No, today it doubled, tripled, or quadrupled, because people just find ways to use their phones more and to use them more efficiently. And right. so I don't think there is, there is an overlap. I think their services are complementary, and they just give people different options to communicate with different people. Got it. The other thing you've been working on, which, which you haven't um, discussed much, is, is encryption. Um, so um, slowly, it seems, you're, you're adding encryption to the product. Um, what, are your, what are your aims there? So we partnered with, with Open Whisper Systems uh, about a year and a half ago, and we've been slowly rolling out end-to-end -end encryption uh, throughout our product. And we've done it in a very, very interesting and unique way. We've done it without people necessarily noticing that, it ha that it's happening. Um, and today, actually, if you use the latest version of Android or latest version of Android, your, your, your messages, your individual messages are already end-to-end uh, -end encrypted. But uh, we're, still, we're almost there. We obviously want to be there as soon as we can. But uh, we're probably a couple of months away or a few months away from kind of calling it done. Um, and when, when it will be done, it will be amazing because it's going to be the largest installation, the largest kind of end-to-end -end installation um, in history with given our user base and given how many people we have. Um, but it's been, it's been a really interesting engineering challenge to do it without dropping messages, without breaking our product, without necessarily making people do something. Um, and uh, soon we're obviously going to be able to talk more about it, but it's, it's just been really, really cool to kind of work on it and get it, yeah. get it done. That's also a hot button topic at the moment um, in, in many different uh, 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 areas of the world. Um, and it has created some controversy. You know, uh, reports indicated that um, your service was used to help plan the Paris attacks. There's a situation in Brazil where you were actually banned for a few hours by the courts um, who are calling for you know, a back door, so to speak. How do you view um, that sort of situation? Well, uh, I think conversation about backdoors to me are just not that productive because we're not going to put backdoors into our app. And I think, you know, if you obviously talk to iMessage, they're not going to put backdoors in, into iMessage. And I think backdoors, what, what they actually do is they create, they create less security. And if anything, people, people in this room should be asking for more digital security, right? Every, every day we hear about a government computer getting hacked or Target getting hacked and people's personal information getting leaked. And it's like, well, you want your personal information to be encrypted without backdoors because the moment you create backdoors, bad guys will find those backdoors. They'll discover a way to break through them and then you just kind of back to square one where you have no, no digital security and no, no privacy with those backdoors. Well said. Well, thank you for, uh, for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks for having chat. us.